Part 1. Little Albert's Story Hi, I'm Little Albert. It was 1920, and I was nine months old when my mom agreed to let some scientists try an experiment. On me, I was just an innocent little baby. They said it was like something called Pavlov's dog, but I didn't know what that meant. I was just a little baby, curious about everything. At first, everything was normal. I crawled around, played with toys, and smiled at the grown-ups. They showed me all sorts of things. A white rat, a rabbit, a dog, even masks and a fur coat. I wasn't scared of any of it. I wanted to touch the animals, and I sometimes laughed at the masks. It all seemed fun. Then came the day of the white rat. I reached out to touch it, but boom, a huge, scary noise rang out behind me. I jumped, my eyes went wide, and I started crying. My little heart raced, and I couldn't stop shaking. I didn't understand why it had happened, but my body was sure it was terrible. They repeated it a few more times. Every time I touched the rat, the loud noise scared me all over again. After a while, I didn't even need the noise. Just seeing the rat made me cry and try to crawl away. I was learning something I didn't want to. That fear could come from something that didn't scare me before. The scientists wanted to see what else would frighten me. They put a fluffy white rabbit in front of me. I shivered and wanted to back away. Then, a dog, a fur coat, and even some masks. If it was fluffy and white, my little body remembered the fear and I felt it again. I didn't understand why this was happening, but my chest felt tight and my arms and legs felt like jelly. Sometimes I tried to reach out, thinking maybe I was brave enough. But the moment I got close, the memory of the loud noise made me freeze. I felt like my heart was trapped in my chest. Even though I was only a baby, I was learning that fear could be taught. Something safe could become scary if it was paired with something frightening. I didn't know if anyone would help me stop feeling scared. I didn't like the tight feeling, the shivers, or the tears that came without me even wanting them. I just knew I didn't want to see the rat or the rabbit ever again. The scientists watched carefully, writing things down, talking quietly to each other, and looking at me with interest. I guess they were learning a lot about how babies like me feel fear, but I was just living it. Every time I saw something fluffy and white, I felt the fear return, even without the loud noise. I don't remember if anyone ever helped me feel safe again, but I do remember how my little body reacted. The loud noise, the soft animals, the strange masks, all of it stayed with me. That experiment taught me fear before I even knew what it really was, and it was something I couldn't understand or control at the time. Looking back, I guess that's what they wanted, to see if fear could be learned. But for me, it just felt like a scary, confusing, and unforgettable time in my little life. Part 2. The Science Behind the Story Now that you've heard Little Albert's story, let's break down the science of what really happened. In 1920, psychologist John B. Watson and his assistant Rosalie Rayner wanted to know, are fears natural or can they be taught? Before this, scientists thought humans were born with only a few automatic fears, like being startled by loud noises or falling. Watson wanted to show that even strong emotions like fear could be conditioned, created through learning. This idea came from classical conditioning, first studied by Ivan Pavlov. Pavlov showed that dogs could learn to associate a sound like a bell with food until the bell alone made them drool. Watson wondered, if a dog can learn to expect food, can a baby learn to expect fear? That's where Albert came in. At first, he showed no fear of animals, masks, or fluffy objects. But when the loud crash of a steel bar was paired with the sight of a white rat, Albert began to cry at the rat alone. This is a textbook case of conditioning. The noise was the unconditioned stimulus, the rat became the conditioned stimulus, and Albert's crying turned into a conditioned response. Watson and Rayner also tested generalization. Would Albert's fear spread? It did. A rabbit, a dog, a fur coat, and even a Santa Claus mask all triggered his fear. Anything white and fluffy now carried the same emotional weight as the rat. The neuroscience of fear. Today, we can explain this using neuroscience. When Albert heard the noise, his amygdala, deep in his brain, activated. The amygdala is the alarm system that detects danger and prepares the body to respond. It works with the hypothalamus and the autonomic nervous system to set off the fight or flight response. A pounding heart, shallow breathing, sweaty palms, and trembling muscles. 
Meanwhile, the hippocampus was recording the memory of the rat and linking it to the frightening noise. Over repeated pairings, the rat became tagged as dangerous. This is how fear learning works. The amygdala ties emotional reactions to sensory input, and the hippocampus helps store the memory so the fear can return later. Once that fear pathway was built, Albert didn't need the noise anymore. The sight of the rat alone was enough to trigger the amygdala and produce fear. Neuroscientists call this a fear circuit, and once it's strong, it can last for years. This is the same system behind human phobias and even post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. Modern lessons and therapy. Watson proved that fear could be taught, but he never showed how it could be unlearned. That's where modern psychology comes in. Today, therapists use something called exposure therapy to help people undo fears. Exposure therapy is based on the same science, but flipped around. Instead of pairing something neutral with something scary, therapists help people face their fear without danger until the brain rewires itself. For example, someone with a fear of spiders might first look at drawings of spiders, then move on to seeing a spider in a sealed container, and eventually work their way up to being in the same room as one. Each step is done carefully and repeated until the brain learns that the situation is safe. Brain scans show that during successful exposure therapy, the prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain that handles reasoning and control, begins to calm the amygdala. This is a powerful example of neuroplasticity, the brain's ability to form new pathways. The old fear circuit weakens, and new circuits of calm and safety grow stronger. This therapy is widely used today for phobias, anxiety disorders, and PTSD. Without experiments like Albert's, we might not have discovered how effective these methods can be. Ethics and legacy. Of course, there's a darker side. Watson and Rayner never deconditioned Albert's fear, which means they left him distressed. By today's standards, the experiment was unethical. Modern psychology requires informed consent, protection from harm, and support if participants become upset. Children especially must be safeguarded. Still, the Little Albert experiment is remembered as a turning point. It showed that emotions are not only natural instincts, they can also be learned, shaped, and even unlearned. It opened the door to understanding how phobias form and how therapies can treat them. Looking back, the experiment on Little Albert taught the world some of the most important lessons in psychology. It revealed that fear is not always something we are born with, but something that can be shaped by experience. It showed that the brain, especially the amygdala and hippocampus, can wire new emotional responses to things that were once harmless, creating powerful fear circuits. These insights gave us a deeper understanding of phobias, anxiety, and trauma and eventually led to treatments that help people break free from those fears.